Uh, thanks, Eric. And uh, I, I was I was just commenting to Linda and um, posted on Twitter actually how nerve wracking it is to talk to your own colleagues. So, um, <laughs> but it actually is really uh, an honor to talk about research. Uh, it's not something I get to do enough of. So I, I hope that you find the next um, hour or two hours or three hours enjoyable. <laughs> um, so last, uh, actually a couple of weeks ago, we had a really nice talk by uh, Professor Stephenson about um, his use of wild species, wild plant species for improved uh, disease resistance in wheat. Um, the research I'm going to tell you about today really builds on this, uh, puts another flavor on this. In fact, I think in many ways, the work that Brian has done, the work that my group has done has been parallel, um, sort of uh, in separate universe, but um, in, in many ways, a similar approach. So we make really extensive use of gene bank collections in our research. And big picture, um, the work that, that I wanted to share with you is figuring out a way to mine gene bank collections for useful genes and to do that in a, a very efficient manner. Now, um, I've been here at the U for 17 years. I was hired to start a genomics program focused on um, diseases of potato late blight in particular. I'm talking to a plant pathology audience, and I'm pretty sure everybody uh, knows about the Irish potato famine, which um, this, this um, statue actually uh, commemorates. So Phytophthora infestans, potato late blight disease, resulted in uh, a million people starving to death and a million more emigrating to this country. What you might not know is that today, worldwide, potato late blight disease is the number one biotic constraint of potato and carries with it about a five to eight billion dollar annual price tag. That's both in, in yield losses and in terms of chemical controls. So if you think about using genomics or um, other omics technologies to find genes for improving plant disease resistance, uh, and your goal is to feed the world sustainably, potato late blight's a really good target. So uh, much of the work that we have done has in fact focused on potato late blight, um, this has taken many different flavors. We've studied transcription of disease resistance genes. We've um, transferred genes into, from a wild species into cultivated background. Invariably, though, the work that we have done has really started with phenotypic discovery of genetic resistance in wild species. So to give you sort of a visual of what this looks like, I'm going to walk you very quickly through a month in the life of a late blight nursery. Um, this is this plot actually is now a gravel mine uh, down at Newmore Park. <laughs> so, um, but, but it is a, a nursery that we ran for nine or 10 years. And the sole purpose of this, this plot is to discover genetic resistance to potato late blight. So number one, this field uh, receives no fungicides at all. Uh, in this field, we plant different potato genotypes, so that could include breeding lines, genetic stocks, uh, and, and in our uh, case, wild species. Now to orient you in this, this field a little bit, every other row, these sort of full rows that you see here, are what we call spread rows. This is a, a cultivated potato that we know to be late blight susceptible. And in between then are the experimental lines, the breeding lines, and the wild species. So this is day zero. Uh, and day zero is the day where we go out and we uh, actually spray spore suspension on the spreader rows. And then we use high uh, overhead irrigation, frequent overhead irrigation to maintain high humidity, which is, is of course preferable for the disease. So this is day zero, the day we inoculate. Um, by day seven, from this vantage point, everything looks fine, but if you stuck your head in the spreader rows, uh, you certainly would see the beginnings of disease development. By day 14, it's pretty obvious that the spreader rows in particular um, are, are pretty diseased. A week later, and then two weeks later, um, it's pretty clear that the bulk of potato germplasm is susceptible to, to late blight disease. Now, of course, we're um, not so interested in the, the materials that were killed by uh, the late blight pathogen, but by the, the relatively few genetic stocks that are disease resistant, and in the majority of cases, those are wild species. So a lot of the work that, that my group has done is focused on wild species as sources of genetic resistance, and these uh, wild species come from, um, pre predominantly from the, the gene bank collections. So this, this phenotype-driven approach to discovery of useful traits in gene bank collections is obviously effective, uh, as shown in this, this figure, uh, but it is also slow and laborious. Now, um, 
our colleagues, including Athena Hagigatalab, Corey Hirsch, Madeline Smith, and others are applying a collection of methodologies that we think of as high throughput plant phenotyping, right? So that, that really means remote imaging to collect data on, um, on, on plant phenotypes, disease resistance, uh, et cetera. So collecting data on large scale with these methodologies is, is really not the biggest challenge. It's making sense of the data. So uh, I think Corey in particular could tell us an awful lot about training computers to actually recognize plants and to understand what a stressed plant looks like when you're flying a drone over a field or to differentiate um, a, a plant that's stressed because of an insect attack versus disease. So that really is where the field of high throughput plant phenotyping is right now. I think it's well positioned to uh, revolutionize what we do in plant pathology. We're not quite there yet. But when it comes to gene bank collections, I would argue that anything that is focused on phenotype discovery is always going to be a bottleneck. The, the phenotyping is always going to be a bottleneck. Uh, and to illustrate my point, I want to share with you uh, four different pictures. This is a, a, a different wild potato species, this time growing at Becker. And uh, from top to bottom, this genotype is growing with, uh, under conditions of increasing herbicide. So zero herbicide at the top and a uh, label recommendation at the bottom. So obviously this wild species is not a good source of herbicide resistance. Um, the funny thing is that in this study, I wasn't really even looking for herbicide resistance. I was trying to figure out how to grow this wild species in a field setting so that I could screen it for late blight resistance without sending out hordes of undergrads to weed the field all summer. So something as mundane as how do you cultivate a wild species or a weed really, uh, becomes a bottleneck in terms of discovering useful phenotypes. Um, understanding what the resistance phenotype even looks like in this case has been a challenge. So this, this particular species turns out to be a fabulous source of resistance to everything that we've tested it uh, against, uh, verticillium wilt, um, uh, late blight, um, and, and also nematodes. But understanding what nematode resistance looks like in this morphology, in this genetic background, uh, can really be a challenge. It actually looks quite different than what we would see in cultivated potato. Um, Any time we're talking about phenotyping plants for disease resistance, pathogen race specificity is a challenge. And of course, any phenotype-driven approach is resource intensive, requiring space, labor, and, and funding. So phenotyping, field-based phenotyping, I think is very valuable when we're talking about mining gene bank collections uh, for useful traits, but it also represents a bottleneck in the discovery of useful genes. So in the last, I think, eight years, um, my group has been working towards a different model in, in trait discovery, and one that is less reliant on phenotyping and more reliant on genotyping. And in particular, we use, we're using genotyping to inform phenotyping or to, or to make better use of, of uh, labor-intensive, resource-intensive phenotyping in our quest for discovering useful traits in gene bank collections. And the work that we're doing uh, predominantly has been in the Rosaceae. At the end of this talk, I'll talk a bit about what we're doing in the Solanaceae and the late blight pathosystem in particular. So um, what we're focusing on is known as R genes. And I just want, I am sure they're uh, pretty much Everyone in this room has heard of our genes. Probably many of you could explain um, how they function uh, in much more detail than I can. But I want to give a quick primer so that we're all on the same page of what these genes are and how they actually function. So um, our genes, first of all, are disease resistance genes. And they're a collection of genes that are found in all higher plants. Um, and they encode uh, proteins with certain conservant motifs. So in particular, we're interested in this, the NB-ARC, the nucleotide binding site, and this, the LRR, or the leucine rich repeat. So regardless of the plant or the pathogen against which this protein is effective, we see uh, this architectural structure emerging time and time again. Now, for the purposes of this talk, um, I want you to remember that there are two flavors of our proteins. They both have the NB-ARC and the leucine rich repeat, the NB-LRR. Uh, but they differ in terms of their N termini. And I'm simply going to refer to these as the TIR type and the non-TIR type. 
Um, the only thing you really need to remember, there are two flavors and that these are monophyletic lineages. So these are really, really ancient lineages, uh, two broad families of, of these genes that have emerged in higher plants. Now at a phenotypic level, these proteins act as cellular sentinels and cellular switches. And the leucine ridge repeat, the LRR, through protein-protein interaction, recognizes the presence of a pathogen. So this may bind, uh, for example, to a protein effector, or it may bind to some plant product that the effector is targeting. So the, the detection can be direct or indirect. Once the leucine rich repeat recognizes the presence of the pathogen, conformational changes in the protein that are mediated in the NB arc domain allow the uh, N termini to signal, a, to activate a, a broad uh, cascade of, of genetic responses that result in the phenotype that we think of as resistance. So for example, these proteins might regulate, ultimately regulate the, the uh, expression of PR genes or um, the, uh, the hypersensitive response. So there are multiple different phenotypes that go into um, our gene-mediated disease resistance. Now, while our understanding of how plants recognize and respond to pathogens has really expanded in the last 20 years, so too is our availability of genomics resources for, for plant biology. Uh, this timeline shows the availability of whole genome sequences for plant species. And the very first plant that had a fully sequenced genome was Arabidopsis baileyana back in 2000, and it was followed very quickly by rice in 2001. And for a long, long time, Arabidopsis was our single model um, sequenced diploid genome, and rice was our single uh, sequenced monocot genome. But um, over time, as DNA sequencing technologies have improved, as informatic strategies have improved, the pace of discovery has really um, also increased. Where's that hand there? Going down. And um, by 2017, a total of 250 different plant species have fully sequenced genomes. So we have a, a really robust uh, data set for um, plant genomes. And as you'll see uh, throughout the course of this talk, that pace of discovery continues to, to expand pretty quickly. So I'm going to talk about work that we're doing in the Rosaceae. Uh, the first three genomes that were sequenced from the Rosaceae included apple, Fragaria vesca. This is a diploid relative of the strawberry and Prunus persica, which is peach. So these three genomes were sequenced to very high quality. Um, they were the first of what are now 15 different rosaceous species that have had their genome sequenced and, and uh, the sequences made publicly available. So we have really a very robust data set in which to work in the rosaceae. So um, it might surprise you to learn that comparative genomics approaches have not been widely used to study our genes. And there are um, particular reasons why that is the case. I'm going to tell you three reasons why I think comparative genomics have not been used to study R genes. First of all, uh, plant genomes contain many, many R genes. And that number is, is quite variable across species. So you're looking at 12 different species in the Rosaceae. And um, to generate this, we systematically mined the genome sequence of those 12 species. And we're reporting here the total number of NBLRR genes um, by species. So this is a Rubus ascendentalis, it's the blackberry genome. There are a total of 43 R genes that we discovered. That, that's a ridiculously small number of R genes uh, for a plant genome. At the other extreme is Malus domestica, or apple, with a total of 663 R genes found in, the, in that genome. So on average, a uh, plant genome usually has several dozen to several hundred R genes, and I think that this um, spread that you see here really represents something of an extreme across this family. Uh, so the fact that there are many R genes in a plant genome and the fact that the total number varies significantly across species really represents a hurdle in terms of applying comparative cross-species analyses to study R genes. Another reason that comparative genomics approaches are rarely used um, is represented in this slide. I have to credit Nevin Young for this. He presented this slide many, many years ago, and I was so struck by it. I asked him if I could use this. I've, I've used it many, many times in my presentation, always crediting uh, Nevin and, and the work that he's done. And Nevin, if I miss anything here, please speak up. <laughs> um, what I'm illustrating here is that our genes evolve very, very quickly. 
So Nevin and his group have, for many years, worked on the model legume Metacago truncatula. And in this study, they sequenced a large number of wild uh, accessions of Metacago. And uh, here are reporting the uh, changes in, in multi-gene families across that data set that they generated. The x-axis is a measure of synonymous changes that they observed. The y-axis is a, a measure of the non-synonymous changes that they observed in this study. And really what you need to know is that anything that's down in this quadrant is relatively slow evolving, and anything that's up here evolves very quickly. Now, uh, amongst the, the uh, components of the plant genome that evolved the fastest in this study are things that we've already talked about, the TIR, the NBR, and the leucine rich repeat. So all of these components of our genes are amongst the fastest evolving of the, the uh, plant uh, genome components. This particular gene is late nodulin. Uh, it's not an R gene, it's not an LR gene, but it is involved in legume rhizobium interactions. So in general, genes in plants that help the plant respond to uh, whatever the microbial population is doing, um, tend to evolve very quickly. We know from a biological perspective that makes good sense as, as microbes continue to adapt, the plant adapts along with it. So this rapid evolution, particularly at R gene loci, uh, creates an issue for applying comparative genomics across various species. Now we've talked already about uh, the overall structure of, of our genes or our proteins. But um, I, I want to tell you a bit about the uh, chromosomal context in which we find R genes. So it's pretty unusual to find a single R gene residing in a single location on a chromosome. Much more often we find uh, R genes in clusters of sequence-related but functionally divergent copies. And this clustering of similar sequences is very important to the overall evolution of these genes. So if we take a look at the gametes, um, recombination within this cluster can very rapidly lead to expansion or contraction of the cluster, and um, each of these, each of the individuals within a cluster represent opportunity to acquire new allelic variation that can further drive the evolution and adaptation of, of the uh, R loci. So this clustering really is very critical biologically, but creates big problems in terms of the comparative, the application of comparative genomics, and in particular, the orthological or evolutionary relationship between genes within the cluster very quickly become obscured. So for comparative genomics, one of the, the, the hallmarks is that uh, the, the comparison of two genes in two different species is only applicable if they have emerged from a common ancestor. Um, so this clustering and especially the expansion and contraction of clusters really muddies those relationships very quickly and represent an issue for comparative genomics. Um, this slide is of Prunus persica. Here we're showing the entire genome of Prunus persica, eight chromosomes arrayed end to end, and each bar that you see here is the location of another R gene that we discovered in this study. And you can see a, a very strong tendency for R genes to cluster in certain genome regions. So um, clustering happens on, on a whole genome scale for these genes. So I'm just going to summarize um, the, the three points I just made. Comparative genomics for R genes rarely applied because plant genomes comprise many R genes. These R genes evolve very quickly, and the one-to-one -one orthological relationships are quickly obscured. But I wouldn't be here today if I didn't think that there's a, a way around this. Um, and in fact, I think there's a lot of potential to apply comparative genomics to our genes and to take that knowledge and apply it to the agricultural improvement of our crops. So um, we're going to talk about the Rosaceae. Um, we've already talked about this family in terms of its rich, robust uh, whole genome sequence data, total of 15 different species at this point. This family also has a very robust well-documented phylogeny with a, a chronological component. So we know that all of the uh, horticultural diversity that represents Rosaceae today evolved from a common ancestor that lived 100 million years ago. We know that species like strawberry and blackberry and rose emerged from a common ancestor 59 million years ago. Our tree fruits, the pomes and the stone fruits, emerged from a common ancestor 52 million years ago. The um, 
apples and pears emerged from an ancestor, a common ancestor 32 million years ago. And we know that the stone fruits, the, the peaches, the plums, have a, a common evolutionary origin uh, and emerged from an ancestor that lived less than 32 million years ago, but we don't know exactly when that is. So the fact that we've got in this family a well-documented phylogeny with a really um, well-documented uh, chronological component allows us to ask and answer some significant questions about the evolution of our genes across the family. So, um, much of the work I'm going to share uh, started with, with Leon. So Leon was a postdoc in my group. Many of you probably know him. He's now the uh, professor of plant biology at Augsburg University. So a lot of the, the conceptual framework, the thinking, the biology behind this comparative genomics approach I'm going to share with you um, grew out of work that Leon did um, and, and uh, that Leon and I did together. Uh, more recently, uh, Greg King has been working with us, and he's a computer engineer, uh, taking the biological concepts and doing the scripting so that we can perform this on a, a, a semi-automated, um, I'd say medium throughput uh, fashion. So there's a, this, this really has been, the work that we've done so far has been almost entirely in silico, um, but I think there's really significant biological applications that I'll talk about as we go through this. So key to our approach to applying comparative genomics to our genes is recognizing that the clusters that we've already talked about that um, create so many problems really represent a degree of phylogenetic redundancy. And what I mean is that while the individual copies may be functionally very different and that clustering might be very important to the biological function, from an evolutionary perspective, these represent genes that come from uh, a single copy that existed sometime in the past. So in other words, the information that we glean from this particular gene copy is more or less identical to um, the information that we glean from that particular copy. So we have opted to collapse that phylogenetically redundant information into a single composite sequence. Um, and this, this composite really is a sort of a placeholder that represents a broader range of diversity that's that is found throughout that whole cluster. So in particular, we've set up um, rules to define what these, these composites are. Um, we're working at a protein level and using an 80% identity in the NB region. So if, if two protein sequences are 81% identical in the NB region, they're collapsed into a single composite sequence. If they're more different than that, they're kept separate. Now this idea of, of collapsing uh, this information, I think of as akin to the species concept. So we, we know as biologists, number one, that species concept really is an artificial construct. But number two, we, we know that it is biologically meaningful. Number three, we know that the individual genotypes in a species are not identical, they differ from each other, but that their commonalities um, warrant them being treated as, as a unit. So in the same way, this composite sequence that um, we're presenting represents genetic diversity found throughout that cluster, but is still an artificial but meaningful construct for discussing and thinking about the evolutionary, especially the deep evolutionary um, patterns of, of our genes. Now, we don't refer to these as composite our gene sequences. We um, have adopted a new nomenclature. We call these the Roser 80 groups. Um, so that stands for Rosaceae, our genes at 80% identity, and we number these sequentially. So this, um, this Roser 80 terminology becomes something that the community at large can use to really discuss the evolutionary relationships of our genes. So um, the, the figures I'm about to show you represent the R gene component of 12 different species. We have applied a, a standard definition of what an NBLR gene is. Um, and th this, as trivial as this may sound, this is um, really a pretty significant advancement, I think, in, in, in terms of comparing our gene components across uh, different plant species. And that's because the, the group that sequenced the apple genome um, was separate from the group that sequenced the peach genome. And when they annotated the genes in those genomes, they used different criteria for what they called an R gene. So we're using a, a common definition. Across these 12 species, we found nearly 2,500 R genes. And applying that 80% identity 
uh, approach, we were able to, to collapse that information down to a total of 651 ROSER 80 groups. And again, these are called ROSER 80-1 uh, to ROSER 80-651. So we have uh, reduced the overall complexity of the data set. This is still a pretty large data set, but it is small enough that we can um, begin to really visualize evolutionary patterns across the whole family. So one of the outputs of our, the script that we've, we've written is a maximum likelihood tree. And um, in this, this tree, so this is a, I think everyone probably has seen trees like this, but um, you know, this is a phylogenetic tree and, and it's curled around on its backbone so that the, the branch tips point out. And in this case, case each of those branch tips uh, represents a group of sequences um, collectively called the Roser 80 groups. Now, um, once we have this tree, we can start to layer different types of information on it. Here I'm showing the representation of, of different uh, Roser 80 groups across groups of plant genomes. Now, um, there are a total of 12 different plant species in this study, and I could show 12 concentric circles uh, radiating out from that tree. It gets really, really messy very quickly. Um, so for simplicity, I'm showing this as a, at a, a higher taxonomic level known as tribe or, or subfamily. So the rosaceae, the family is up here, tribes are below that, and then individual species are below that. So we have a total of four tribes that are represented in this data set. The rubiae is this deep purple. Uh, and if you look here, for example, there's a deep purple bar right here, which indicates that the corresponding roser 80 group as representation in the genome of Rubus ascendentalis, the, the blackberry. The potentile here is a, a tribe that includes six different Fregaria species, so strawberry species, shown in red. The amygdalae are the stone fruits, and in this particular analysis, we have two different prunus species. We've got peach and the Japanese plum. And then the pyrea, in this case, uh, represents the poems we have uh, apple, the European, and the Asian pear in this particular study. So immediately you begin to recognize the, uh, the or, or visualize the patterns of evolution and representation of individual R genes, R gene groups over 100 million years of evolution in this tree. Um, we can, at a, a topological level, define individual clades. And um, the clades are, in total, we've identified nine clades in the study. and We've labeled them A, B, C, all the way through clade I. Early on, I told you there are two different flavors of NBLRR proteins. And in fact, we, um, in this study, could recover both the TIR type and the non-TIR type. Um, these, remember, are monophyletic lineages. So the fact that we can recover the TIR and, TI and non-TIR type distinction uh, in this particular tree is, is almost an internal check. It tells us that this grouping that our approach to phy the phylogenetics of our genes really is giving information that makes good biological sense. Now, um, this particular figure uh, includes a total of, of 12 different species. I mentioned that the rosaceae at this point, we've got um, 15 publicly available sequences. So the uh, sequence of, of rose was published last year. The sequence of sweet cherry, which is Prunus avium, was published uh, also last year. And then more recently, the genome of, of an ornamental species, Potentilla, um, was published. So this is a close relative of strawberry. So we're working now to uh, incorporate those three different genome sequences into the overall analysis. So this, this figure, uh, relatively simple, but now that this actually took about five years, by the way, so it was simple, but um, took a very, very long time to, to get this far. But now that we have this, we actually can use this as a tool to understand the evolutionary biology of our genes and to apply it to agricultural uh, application, in particular improvement of crop plants. So I'm going to tell you two different aspects of the story now, uh, evolutionary observations that come out of this and then application for um, what we've learned. So the first, the first um, evolutionary observation that comes out of our figure is that our gene lineages are of ancient origin. Um, and this probably isn't very surprising. What it means in, in this context is that this amazing plant that lived 100 million years ago and gave us all the wonderful fruits and flowers that are 
um, in the rosacea today already was challenged by pathogens and already had the ancestors of most of the nine clades of our genes that we discovered in this study. And of course, as this species became some new species uh, 59 million years ago, the morphology, the physiology of that plant species changed, the pathogen pressures that it encountered also changed. But the, the R genes that were already present 100 million years ago adapted and evolved into a new set of R genes. Um, similarly, throughout the evolution of the family until the extant species today have a, a collection of diverse R genes that are uniquely adapted to the pathogen pressures that each plant species encounters. But um, of course, the R genes that we find here trace their lineage back, in most cases, to 100 million years. Uh, the second evolutionary observation really is sort of a corollary of the first, and that is um, everything is everywhere. Uh, except when it's not. So there are some exceptions to this everything is, ev uh, is everywhere rule, and to me the exceptions are really the interesting thing. So I want to highlight the exceptions. Uh, this figure, uh, so I'm actually going to show this in a couple different ways. It's, it's difficult to sort of capture these exceptions, so um, I'm going to show it in a couple different ways. Uh, and this figure is best read from right to left. So on, on the right we've got the um, uh, we're, we're indicating whether our genes are of the TIR or non-TIR type. Next, we map the presence of each onto the uh, nine clades, the A through I, that we define based on the tree topology. And then finally, we're uh, representing the presence of each individual clade back onto the genome of the 12 different species that we've analyzed. Now, um, if you stare at this for a very long time, there are a couple things that'll jump out. Number one um, is this guy here. This is clade F, a uh, very, very tiny R gene clade. And in fact, it's represented in this study by a single uh, Roser 80 group. And it is only found in Pyrus, the, the, both the um, Asian and the uh, European pair, and in Malice. So in other words, it appears that this this R gene clade is of relatively recent origin. It's only found in the poem fruits, not found in any of the other species. So this kind of observation can only come from comparative analyses. If we're only looking at the apple genome and say, oh, look, there, there's an R gene, we'd have no context for understanding how recently this, this um, gene or gene family evolved. Now, in a similar way, um, clade A is very well represented across most of the species in, in this study. Um, and when we first did this analysis, we had pr only Prunus persica um, was the only stone fruit that was included in our data set. And uh, I was very surprised to learn that clade A was absent in the genome of Prunus persica. Now, there could be technical reasons for that, right? The sequence quality might not be that good, but Prunus persica was one of those species that was really sequenced to high quality. It's possible that the particular genotype of Prunus persica that was selected lacked that, but if we looked at lacked uh, clade A, but if we looked at a different genotype, maybe clade A would be present. So they're both technical and biological reasons. Um, as time went on, Prunus mume, the uh, Japanese plum, was sequenced, and we had access to that sequence. And um, lo and behold, clade A missing in Prunus mume. Um, so the plot thickens, right? <laughs> Um, it, it's looking more and more like clade A might, in fact, be absent um, in these particular species while it's present throughout the rest of the family. So the most parsimonious interpretation of this is that clade A originated more than 100 million years ago, but that has been lost in the lineage that gave rise to current stone fruits. So um, this, this actually is a good point for me to emphasize that the observations that I'm describing really are hypotheses. And I think that the data visualization that we're doing um, is fantastic at creating uh, new hypotheses, things that we wouldn't see except through comparative analyses. And of course, downstream, there's a lot of uh, hypothesis testing that we'll pursue. Now, these same observations I just highlighted um, also are represented on the original tree that you saw. So clade F, which is present only in apple and pear, is represented by the very thin blue line, a single it's actually not that one, it's, it's right here. This single um, Roser 80 group found in pear and apple. And uh, clade A would be shown here. We see representation in uh, tribe Rubiae 
in the Potentile and in Pyrrhea, but we see um, it entirely absent in the genome sequences of Prunus mumae and Prunus persica. Now, um, that last point, uh, I want to highlight that as of last year, Prunus avium was also sequenced. So of course, we have looked whether or not plate A is present in Prunus avium. I don't have the pretty complete picture to show you, uh, but this slide summarizes what we found. While clade A is, uh, in fact, found in these tribes, it is absent in all three of the prune species that we've looked at. So I, I think that's pretty cool. Like, what the heck is clade A doing? Why is it not important to prunus? Um, an observation that comes only through a comparative genomics approach. Now, um, there's one other observation that I want to highlight in this um, exception to everything is everywhere rule. And this comes from uh, Fregaria species. So in total, we had six different Fregaria or strawberry sequences to access in this study. And this table summarizes the, the composition of our genes across those species. So the, the columns here are different Fregaria species. And the rows represent the nine clades, A through I, uh, our gene clades that we, we described in, in the study. Now, there, there are actually two types of data that are summarized here. Um, I'm not going to go into the, the difference. They're actually related. The thing I want you to know is if you see a circle, it means an R gene is present in that genome. And if you don't see a circle, it's, it's not present. And the bigger the circle, the redder it is, the more R genes are, are actually present there. Um, a couple things jump out right away. Clade F, completely absent. Um, again, that was only found in apple and pear, so that makes sense. It's, it's not found in the Fregaria species. But I'm really sort of disturbed by this column. So this is Fregaria vesca. Um, this is the diploid relative of strawberry, one of the first rosaceous species to be sequenced. And many, many um, labs have used Fregaria vesca as a model for how things work in the rosacea, and it's tractable in lots of different ways. Um, but I'm very disturbed that three of the R gene clades that we've discovered um, across the collection of Fregaria are, are, are missing in that particular uh, genome sequence. Again, there could be technical reasons, although Fregaria vesca was sequenced at a very high level, um, but there can also be biological reasons. So I, to me, this is sort of a wake-up call that we shouldn't over rely on model species, and in fact, what I want is lots and lots of genome sequences from lots and lots of different genotypes from lots and lots of different species. Um, so I think as, as we generate more and more sequence data, we'll have a much more robust understanding. But don't rely too heavily on model species. All right, um, a third evolutionary observation I want to share with you is that patterns of R gene homology reflect species phylogeny. And that, that sounds like a, a sort of a tongue twister. Uh, I'm going to walk you through it because I think it's an important observation. Now, um, remember that our approach here is to collapse what we're calling phylogenetic redundancy into these composite sequences that we're calling ROSER 80 groups. As we go through this process, it's important to understand that we are not constraining uh, the species uh, affiliation um, or, or composition in, in these particular sequences. So in other words, a ROSER 80 group can come, can be a collection of sequences from one species. Sometimes a ROSER 80 group is a collection of species uh, of, sorry, sometimes a ROSER 80 group is a collection of sequences from multiple different species. And um, so you can actually see in some cases, uh, for example, right here, this ROSER 80 group includes sequences from multiple different species. The majority, uh, for example, here contain sequences from a single species. And that's all summarized right here. So this, again, is at a tribe level. Um, but we're indicating the composition of ROSER 80 groups. So whether the uh, sequences in a ROSER 80 group come from one species or multiple species. So what we find is that most our gene lineages are tribe specific, which feels really good as a plant pathologist because we know the microbes, the pathogens, are evolving very quickly. We know that the plant um, genome is, is responding in the R genes in particular are evolving very quickly. So the fact that the majority of ROSER 80 lineages are tribe specific makes good biological sense. But we find that when, um, when a ROSER 80 group includes sequences from more than one tribe, the more closely related the tribes, the more likely we are to see ROSER 80 groups represented in common between them. Okay, so for example, the amygdalae or the stone fruits and the uh, pomes, 
um, share 17 different sequences. The Rubier and the Potentiale share four. And if you remember back to that tree, uh, these diverged, uh, no, I've, I've actually forgotten, 52 million years ago, I think it was. Um, and these diverged from each other 59 million years ago. More distantly related, though, are um, the other relationships within the family. And in fact, we see very few Roser 80 lineages shared between them. So, so in other words, um, the more closely related to plant species, the more likely they are to have our genes that are pretty similar in, in, at a DNA sequence level. That makes good intuitive sense, I think. The fact that we're actually seeing that here um, is, is really the, the rationale for applying a comparative genomics approach in, in the first place. Now, there is um, another pattern that I want to highlight, and, and there are a few R genes that we've discovered in this study that really are very, very slow evolving. And in particular, I already showed one actually a moment ago on that tree. There, there are four Roser 80 groups that include sequences from all those tribes. So this is 100 million years of evolution. And you know, our, our whole, the whole premise of our study is that our, gene, uh, our genes evolve really, really quickly. Um, so what is it that's unique about these four? I want to come back to that at the end because I have some ideas, but I'd really love to pick your brain. Um, but, but this, again, highlights, I think, the, the power of comparative genomics. If we weren't looking across species, we'd never know that there's a, a small set of our genes that are very slow to evolve. All right, so my last evolutionary observation, um, I think it's the most important in terms of application, and that is that species differ in patterns of our gene diversification. Um, and I'm going to jump right to uh, a tangible example of this. We see in, in clade E, let me back up here. We see clade E is really well represented um, across the entire family from the Rubier to the, the Potentile, uh, the Amygdalae, and the Pyrrhea. So um, that, that clade is found uh, in all rosaceous species. But within the clade, we see patterns of diversification that are species or tribe specific. So for example, the subclade in clade E found only an apple and pear. Um, so this observation, I think, really means something biologically, that whatever the subclade is doing is really, really important to apple and pear, and it's entirely irrelevant to strawberry. So um, visualizing this pattern, I think, is the first step in actually utilizing the evolutionary history to mine gene bank collections for, for useful trades. And you know, we, th this is, um, I'm, I'm showing one example of this, um, but there, there are lots of others. Strawberry loves this particular clade, right? There's a lot of diversification happening in strawberry and not much happening in those other species. Now, if, if we step back a moment and think about what agriculture, actually, I'm going to, I'm going to table this because I actually have a whole section on this in just a moment. So I, I think this observation is really important to the overall function of it. Um, one other type of data that we've layered on, on top of this tree that will be um, important in just a moment is this heat map that shows the, how many sequences went into a given Roser 80 group. So Roser 80 group might be two sequences in size, and in this case it's, it's shown as a, a, a black sequence. So anything that you see here uh, shown in black means that the Roser 80 group has only two sequences. Um, at the other extreme in this study, we've, we've identified a Roserady group with more than 60 individual sequences. So these are micro variations on a theme, right? And to me, that's a pattern of, that's a pattern of iterative evolution with um, one gene working well and the, the evolutionary dynamics of the plant genome make a larger cluster with lots and lots of copies that differ just a little bit from it. Um, and that, that allelic diversity then is something upon which pathogen populations can act. So that will become important in, in just a moment. Right now, from an evolutionary perspective, um, I've talked about four different observations. One, our gene lineages are of ancient origin. Two, uh, everything is everywhere except when it's not. Three, patterns of our gene homology reflect species phylogeny. And four, species differ in patterns of our gene diversification. So this last observation in particular leads us to the agricultural application of this. And in particular, testing some of the hypotheses that we visualized in this, this data uh, visualization exercise. So um, one of the, the key questions that has emerged in my, my career has, has been, uh, has, agricultural, has agriculture escalated the molecular arms race between plants 
and pathogens. That would be a great prelim question. Actually, forget I said that because it would be on the next prelim. <laughs> but uh, we know from a, a really elegant, robust literature that large-scale monoculture has impacted the effector component of pathogen genomes. And in particular, we see um, pathogen populations and, and pathogen genomes um, really adapting to large-scale monoculture and the, the, the resistance that's found in that particular host. I think the exact same thing is happening in the plant. And in particular, the pressures that pathogens and breeders and consumers of, of food crops have put on uh, plant genomes has manifested um, in, in these uh, clades that are highly diversified one species versus another and really um, represent a, a selective pressure that tells us what an evolutionary pattern of a useful, an agriculturally useful gene can look like. Um, now, to explain what that means, let me give you a tangible example from uh, apple scab. So we've done work in uh, apple scab. Um, this is a pathogen caused by Venturi and Aqualis. It's a pathogen of both the fruit and the leaves. You can imagine that throughout the the, um, the history of apple that, that people have sort of unintentionally selected uh, scabby apples, right? Nobody wants to eat scabby apples, so why would you save the seeds from it? So there's probably been a history of unintentional selection. There's definitely been a history of concerted breeding for apple scab resistance. And in fact, um, in the literature, there are a total of 20 different genes that have been described, mostly at a phenotypic level. Um, so these are all resistance genes to Venturia and Aqualis. Um, two of these have been cloned. They are NBLRR types. Um, another 13 have been mapped to a genome location. So there are markers associated with it, but we don't actually know what the underlying gene is. So in this study, uh, we mined the literature and identified uh, markers associated with each of these genes and then put the markers back onto the apple genome sequence and identified corresponding candidate NBLR genes that we discovered through our pipeline. So for a total of 15 of these genes, we've got what we think are, are pretty good um, NBLR candidates for them. And our hypothesis here is that apple scab resistance genes should occupy species-specific, highly diversified Roser 80 clades. Um, we already talked about an example from uh, clade E. And in fact, from that same, very same clade, that very same subclade that we've talked about, um, three of the 15 R genes that have been reported in the literature um, map to this particular subclade. So this pattern of highly species-specific diversified clades um, seem to correlate really well with, with apple scab resistance. And in fact, the uh, individual Roser AD groups or diversity bins that are uh, from, from which these things are, are um, called are amongst some of the, the larger bins. So remember that this is a heat map with black representing just two sequences. This represents sort of a mid-range about 30 different sequences. So th this again is consistent with this pattern of iterative evolution. Um, perhaps the apple genome identified a gene that is effective against um, Venturia and Aqualis and the evolutionary dynamics have resulted in expanded gene clusters um, associated with, with this functional copy that represents increased allelic diversity. Sometimes that allelic diversity is effective, sometimes it isn't. So essentially, if, if something's working well, um, the, the plant genome seems to say, um, let's make more copies and see how that works for us. Now, I'm only showing three examples of this, but across the whole genome, we had really strong statistical support for the idea that this, this pattern of highly diversified um, subclades are telling us something about the agricultural application of, of these genes. Is that clear to everyone? Now, um, that observation opens the door for allele mining of gene banks. And in particular, identifying novel alleles at a DNA sequence level that may speed uh, discovery uh, and um, discovery of, of new traits and associated markers. This is work that we've been working on um, for probably a decade. We've been working with Stan Hokinson and Horticulture and David Slezak at University of Wisconsin River Falls. Uh, this project is part of the Rose Cap, a USDA um, project that aims to develop markers for marker-assisted breeding for disease-resistant rosaceous crops, and, and Rose is one of those. 
So um, Stan and David created a, a large segregating population for black spot resistance. Black spot um, is a really important target for, for rose breeding. Uh, we have generated large data sets of, of phenotypic screening. Um, some, some of you may see David in my lab uh, on weekends and evenings. Um, what he's actually doing is, is some of this testing. Um, so we've got a large segregating population, good phenotypic data, data and we have associated um, SNP markers through this study. Now, we want to add to that by leveraging our Roser 80 uh, approach to identify perfect markers. And this is really in here as a placeholder, uh, just to let you know that we have already begun work on the, the, the uh, Rose genome. Um, here we're actually comparing it to Frigeria vesca and Rubus occidentalis. So the, the Roser 80 um, approach, this pipeline that we've created, can apply at a family level, but it also can apply at more closely related um, species levels as well. So uh, as I mentioned, our, our, pri our effort here is to uh, identify perfect markers for marker-assisted breeding. A perfect marker in this context is a marker that actually comes from the causative allele. And we're um, turning to approach very similar to what Brian talked about, um, this, this idea of RENSEQ, which utilizes a, a, a known R gene sequence to pull down similar, not identical, but similar sequences from related genotypes or species um, so that you can create a pool, of, that's a DNA pool that's enriched for R gene sequences. This allows us to sequence the R gene component of plant genomes at, at pretty high efficiency. So we've already created uh, DNA baits from the Rosaceae, leveraging what we've learned in the Roser 80 system. Um, we've already created the resistant and susceptible bulks based on the phenotypic data that we have generated so far. Um, our goal is to create sequence libraries with allele level resolution that will allow us to identify candidate polymorphisms that are linked specifically to black spot resistance and then to validate on the larger uh, population. So um, we're actually at a sort of impasse here because I'm waiting for funding on this. So we're, we're still working on this. But um, this will be the first sort of proof of concept for what we imagine will be a larger scale mining of rose germplasm. And um, as we generate more arginine data for rose or for any other species, it'll feed back into the rose 80 system. And that figure that I showed you will be completely updated and um, will we'll be uh, refined and the, 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 the scale of our observations will be much more detailed. Now, um, that same approach will be, can be applied to discover uh, unique alleles of apple scab or potato late blight or, or really any other um, disease resistance phenotype. The work that we're doing is at a DNA sequence level. Our goal is to identify genotypes or populations or species that have unique alleles at resistance loci that we think are going to be agriculturally important. As we identify those genotypes or populations or species, they become targets for phenotypic testing. So this doesn't negate the importance of phenotyping. Um, the approach that I just described helps us make better choices of genotypes for um, the, the uh, application of, of phenotyping. And again, phenotyping, I think, is really the bottleneck in this trait discovery. So applied as a system, this should allow us to mine gene bank collections much more efficiently. Um, I'm gonna just blow through this. I, I mentioned these slowly evolving R genes. Some of the ideas that we've come up with, um, so these are genes that over 100 million years have not diverged by more than 20% in the NB um, domain. Uh, these genes might be involved in non-host resistance. They could be involved in maintenance of positive plant microbe interactions. Um, maybe they're not disease resistant genes at all. Something like environmental stress, something that would be a stable phenotype. Um, might, might account for these slow levels of evolution. Uh, more recently, we have um, begun looking at the Solanaceae, so we're using our same pipeline, that same approach, to look at, uh, in this case, seven genomes that have been sequenced in the Solanaceae. This includes um, uh, the potato, a wild potato, tomato, a wild tomato, and then the more distantly related capsicum and, and Nicotiana. Um, we also are including in this analysis a collection of about 15 cloned NBLRR genes for late blight resistance. And um, this figure looks not that different than what we're seeing in the Rosaceae, but there are a couple striking things that jump out. And um, first of all, this black color that you see here are the late blight resistance genes. And the stars that you see here indicate representation of that gene across 
all of the plant genomes or most of the plant genomes that we're looking at. So one of the things that really jumps out is that late blight resistance is found, or at least the gene that, that corresponds to late blight resistance in potato is found throughout this family. Um, we, we see the same pattern here, um, very similar pattern here missing in one species, very similar here missing in one species. So this tells me, um, in fact, that Phytophthora and the Solanaceae had a really long coevolutionary history. And that maybe as the plant diverged to become two different species, maybe Phytophthora um, diverged to become different species that infect these new plant species. So to this list, of why those, those four genes in the rosaceae are evolving so slowly. I think it can add, um, perhaps, we're really observing a pattern of coevolution, which is almost the opposite of what um, we started at. Now, these are really fun, sexy um, ideas, I think. Um, some of them have really good application to agriculture. The challenge is how do we pick apart these hypotheses? How do you, I mean, I can imagine overexpressing a gene, knocking a gene out. What is the phenotype? What pathogen do you screen against? Um, so any thoughts you have and how we can actually pick this apart would be really appreciated. All right, I'm just going to summarize quickly. I've presented a comparative genomics framework for our genes. Uh, this has led to a series of evolutionary observations, some of which I think have direct application to agriculture. Um, the thing that's really unique about this approach is the potential to generate hypotheses that can link sequence diversification patterns to specific function. I give you a tangible example from Apple, um, Apple Scab. And finally, though, the goal here is the potential to mine gene bank collections for crop, crop improvement. To do that in a much more strategic resource, um, uh, logical fashion, I would say. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions or comments.